Now, in terms of electoral politics um, that used and exploited the media to consolidate its, its power, we really can't underestimate the seismic shift that was occurring with the two parties uh, during this time. Um, at the time, most Southern whites voted Democratic. Uh, this had to do perhaps with some of FDR's policies, New Deal policies that did help poor whites during the Depression and after the Depression, uh, as well as the pro-union stance of most Democrats. His union still had some force back then. They really don't anymore. Um, but a lot of it also had to do with the legacy of the Civil War, that uh, Lincoln was a Republican. Lincoln was seen to have you know, freed the slaves. And so there was a lot of that explicit racist backlash against that that went back to the end of the Civil War. Um, and these were the so-called Dixiecrats, you know, people like Strom Thurmond and at the time, George Wallace. Many of you maybe know George Wallace as the uh the f the famous alabama government governor who um uh, instituted a, a very rigorous and strict policy of segregation but in 1958 wallace was actually a democrat um and he ran f in the democratic primary for governor against a guy named john malcolm patterson and he uh, george wallace spoke against the kkk and he was endorsed by the naacp so at this time, um, who, someone who later became one of the faces for the, the racism of, of, of Republicans and conservative ideology was in fact a Democrat at this time. But this loss in the primary against Patterson really changed um, uh, George Wallace's strategy. And arguably, he marked the beginning of the the shift from racist language to law and order language, which is an explicit code that when we listen to, if you listen to, if you choose to listen to Lee Atwater's um, statement on this, is just embedded in, in, in the language, the shift from, from racist language to law and order language. Um, in 63, Wallace did in fact uh, win the governorship and at the inauguration address he says in the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny and I say segregation now segregation tomorrow segregation forever um, to, to go back to Lincoln the idea was it was seen and you'll hear some of these 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 conversations about the civil war and and how oh it was more of an issue about liberty and states right and individual freedom than it was about slavery which is explicit code kind of justifying racism and slavery but you still get that today where where a, a lot of you know kind of alt-right commentators will be like oh you know the democrats are the racist because it was a republican who freed the slaves so they don't acknowledge this shift uh, in the way, granted, with the big caveat of that, of Mirakawa's critique, of Gottschalk's critique about the way that Democrats and, and liberal and neoliberal policies contribute to this, but nonetheless, using, just for conveniently forgetting this moment when the, the parties uh, explicitly shifted. And, you know, the way that they couch a lot of these these poly progressive policies that are trying to legislate or instantiate uh, equal rights amendments, uh, access to voting laws and, you know, or, uh, the, the voting booth, access to, you know, education, access to the economy. They always couch these in as, as, as a, the federal government overstepping its bounds. Uh, but really, the effect of it is always on the poor communities of color. And so there was great opposition by Southern Democrats um, when LBJ, a Southerner from Texas, signed the Civil Rights Bill into law on July 2nd, 1964. And on the night President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, uh, he told his young aide, Bill Moyers, uh, which you may know from PBS, he told Bill Moyers, quote, I think we just delivered the South to the Republican Party for a long time to come, end quote. Of course, you remember that LBJ became president after the assassination of, of JFK. So later that year in 64, when he was running for the presidency, 
<clears throat> he ran against Barry Goldwater. And the the nomination of Goldwater, uh, who in the pri primaries ran against none other than Nelson D. Rockefeller of the Rockefeller drug, drug laws, was itself controversial in terms of strategy and, and that the party, how the party thought, how the Republican Party thought they could beat LBJ. Uh, and it was the beginning of what's come to be known as the Southern Strategy, which is a, a series of veiled or not so veiled exploitations of, of race as a way to keep the South in Republican hands. So here's a quick excerpt of Goldwater and his uh, outright opposition as a uh, as a campaign policy, as a campaign strategy, his outright opposition to the Civil Rights Act. What I remember most about the 64 campaign was the 64 Civil Rights Act. My dad had been a Republican all his life. And in 64, he switched. And he voted for Johnson and he became a Democrat because Goldwater was against the 64 Civil Rights Act. Are you concerned perhaps about the Democrats taking advantage of this? After Lyndon Johnson, the biggest faker in the United States, having opposed the Civil Rights Act, for all the years of his life, this is the phoniest individual that ever came around. Did you get that? <clears throat> Lyndon Johnson, a Southern senator who'd long been ambivalent about civil rights legislation, made big efforts to complete an agenda that Kennedy had not been able to complete. My fellow Americans, I am about to sign into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I want to take this occasion to talk to you. The 1954 Supreme Court decision against segregation in public schools sent a signal to black Americans that the highest court in the land had given the seal of approval to what we were fighting for, for racial integration. Well, with the schools, there was a 10-year period when the country didn't follow through on it. You have said, I believe, that we have no right to tell the southern states what they must do about school integration. I can't understand this statement. Um, do you mean to say the Supreme Court decision is null and void? No, it, the Supreme Court decision is not necessarily the law of the land. The Constitution still is. We, they, they interpreted by that action that it was wrong to have segregation. Now, they didn't spell out what was to be done. Conservatives did not feel that uh, it was something that the federal government should legislate on. What the president has proposed in this bill is a law which will eliminate one of the most embittering forms of racial discrimination. The denial of free access to places of public accommodation, restaurants, stores, hotels, lunch counters, and other establishments of service or amusement. I will never vote for a public accommodations clause in any civil rights bill because I think it's unconstitutional. I think it tampers with the rights of assembly, the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and the freedom of property. In my home state, we have very few public places that remain segregated by pointing out to business people that it is morally wrong to practice discrimination, and it's also economically bad. This type of approach, while I know it's time-consuming, it is having its effect, will have its effect, and I think it will achieve what we want. Well, like what year? in 1967, in 1979, in 1983. Is it okay during the intervening times that a black kid in a high school baseball team can't stay at a motel? This is the basic disagreement between the Negro community and Senator Goldwater. They don't think he's prejudiced. They don't think he's a racist. I don't think he's a racist. But they can't go along with a man who says we ought to let what's going on in Mississippi be settled by Mississippi, and the federal government ought to knit or do something else. This we can't take. On the eve of the convention, 40,000 people, half of them Negroes, demonstrate against Goldwater in the largest civil rights demonstration since the March on Washington last summer. I am compelled to urge uh, Negroes and all people of good will to vote against him. His election would be a tragedy and certainly suicidal almost for the nation and the world.
You know, nobody knows, or none of us knew, what Senator Goldwater's motives were. We had to take him at his word that this was a constitutional, a philosophical objection. Um, people respected that, that there could be a difference of opinion. But he was wrong. He was just plain wrong. And because he was wrong, he made his party wrong. And he made the Democrats right. That's not to say that LBJ did not contribute to this in his campaign, at least to the general sense of fear and anxiety, because at the same time the Cold War was going on. This was the beginning of the the ramping up of, of the Vietnam War. And so uh, uh, there's some famous ads that LBJ used in his uh, campaign about the threat of nuclear warfare and some 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 really strange and surreal ones but very famous ones that are also part of this whole landscape of fear and anxiety that eventually uh sets the ground for nixon's exploitation of this fear and anxiety so here's some ads from lbj on that do you know what people used to do they used to explode atomic bombs in the air now, children should have lots of vitamin A and calcium, but they shouldn't have any strontium-90 or cesium-137. These things come from atomic bombs, and they're radioactive. They can make you die. Do you know what people finally did? They got together and signed a nuclear test ban treaty, and then the radioactive poison started to go away. But now, there's a man who wants to be president of the United States, and he doesn't like this treaty. He fought against it. He even voted against it. He wants to go on testing more bombs. His name is Barry Goldwater. And if he's elected, they might start testing all over again. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. Interesting, strange, a little bit eerie. Um, another key element during this time was Reagan's rise in California. So now we're getting back to that moment with, with George Jackson and the Attica prison uprising. And Reagan became uh, the governor in 1967. And remember, how was Reagan known? He was an actor. Uh, so he was this kind of uh, square jawed, handsome, handsome guy that everyone knew from being beamed into their, in their living rooms. Uh, and so, this gave him a lot of popularity that then allowed him to become a governor and then uh, president. We see the same thing with our reality TV president who, you know, many people just became familiar with him through his TV appearances and had some kind of, I don't know, camaraderie or trust and, and kind of somehow enjoyed his Anti his seemingly anti-establishment and abrasive attitude, like they knew him, like he was a pal, which uh, some writers have, have uh, theorized that this was one of the reasons uh, why certain uh, populations voted for him. Anyways, there's another connection of media, not just in the, the sensationalization, the demonization of certain populations, but also the way it creates a kind of familiarity or an ideal. And also, to, to echo McLuhan, it's a, it's a cold medium, it's a passive medium. It, it renders us passive in terms of just consuming information, consuming the world and spectating the world instead of participating in the world. And so then if, if we watch the right shows or listen to the right podcasts or even maybe even read the right articles, then we know, and that's, all, that's the minimal duty we have to do. We don't have to actually um, kind of participate in changing the system. So the medium itself, all of those ways in which television is, is one of the central characters during this moment. 